The reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 26, and we're reading from verse 17 to 35, and it can be found in the church Bibles on page 1006, 1006. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparation for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to, one, to him, one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Passover. Like any good Jew, I've celebrated it year on year as long as I can remember. It's the story that defines our people. The people of God reminds us who we are. The people God brought out of slavery in Egypt. The people he chose to be his own. 
It connects us with our great, 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 ever so many great grandparents who God saved with his mighty hand and outstretched arm and with all our ancestors since then. The unleavened bread reminds us of the haste with which our our forebears had to leave Egypt. No time to let the bread rise. The bitter herbs remind us of the years of pain, the tears that filled their eyes with the whips of their slave masters. The lamb who died in place of our people's eldest sons, whose blood we painted on the doors of our house, a sign to the angel of death that those inside, they're paid for. Don't touch them. And we've celebrated Passover for centuries, always the same way. The ritual is part of what makes it so special. Passed down from parents to children, to their children, to their children, to their children, through generation and generation. But that night, the night before Jesus died, that was a Passover like none ever. Never experienced one like it. I think it's probably fair to say that improvisation isn't exactly thought of highly among our people. We're one for tradition. But Jesus didn't seem to care one bit. He knew exactly what he was doing and why. It didn't make sense to us at the time, but... It was as if Jesus thought that every Passover we've ever celebrated for over a thousand years was leading to that night. As if every feast we've celebrated for over a thousand years was just the starter and the main course was here. You won't understand how world shattering that meal with Jesus was until you understand with me what Passover is meant to be, or at least what I thought it was meant to be. So let me remind you, God chose our our ancestor Abraham and his family to be his own special people, a people who would know him, a people who would make him known to the rest of the world around them so that through him, through his family, through us, The whole world would be restored to his Eden blessing. By his grace, God God miraculously gave Abraham and Sarah a child in their old age. Beyond all human hope, beyond all human comprehension. And their family grew and grew and grew. And and Abraham's great-grandson, Joseph, was sold as a slave to an Egyptian But he ended up becoming second only to Pharaoh and rescuing all the rest of his family from from a famine that took hold of the land. And our people lived in Egypt for many years. And in time, God blessed us. And we grew in number. But as we grew in number, the, the attitude of Pharaoh began to change. Soon they grew afraid of us, saw us as a threat, worried that we would overrun them. They made our lives a living hell. They worked us into the ground. Got a new pyramid we want you to build. And we cried out to God for help again and again and again. And for so long, it seemed as if heaven was silent. But God raised up for us a deliverer, Moses. And God sent Moses to Pharaoh with a message, let my people go. But Pharaoh wouldn't listen. 
His heart was cold and hard. And at first, things only seemed to get worse. He ordered us to make the same number of bricks as before, but this time they weren't going to give us any straw to make them with. But God wasn't finished, and he wasn't surprised. He knew Pharaoh's heart. He knew that it would take a mighty hand to compel him to let our people go. So God sent plague after plague on Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Warnings to change their ways or face a a still worse judgment. Blood, frogs, gnats, flies, pestilence, boils, hail, locusts, darkness. But Pharaoh's heart only became harder and harder and harder. So finally, God warned him that the tenth plague is going to be the worst of all. Every firstborn son in the land of Egypt would die, even in the palace. And then God gave our people a sign. He said each family was to take a spotless lamb, kill it, and paint its blood on the doorposts of the house. And on the night of God's judgment, the blood would say, The lamb died instead of us. And that night it was just as God said. His angel went through every street in Egypt, bringing death to the firstborn son in every family, but passing over the houses of every Israelite family. In the middle of the night, blood-curdling cries of grief filled the darkness. Even the corridors of Pharaoh's palace were filled with sobbing, uncontrollable sobbing for the king's own son had died. And Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron to himself and told them to take our people and go, just go. Straight away. And so that very night we fled out of Egypt and out of slavery. God even parted the waters of the Red Sea to bring us to safety. And after more than 400 years, we were free at last. Free to be God's people. Free to love him and to worship him and live our lives for him. That's the story we tell every Passover. The story of how God raised us from Egypt to a new Eden. From slavery to freedom. From death to new life. Every Passover is a freedom party. Independence Day. It's not just a celebration of what God did all those years ago, but a celebration that we're the same people. The same family that God loved and chose and promised to rescue. So you see, every, fam- every Passover is a family meal. Reminding us who we are. Reminding us whose we are. But it also reminds us who God was. Who, who God was, who God is, who God will always be. God loved us. He rescued us so that we might belong to him. So that we might be his people and he might be our God. And each Passover we celebrate declares in no uncertain terms. We are his. And he is ours. So you see the the Passover is about the new beginning God gives us. Listen to what Moses said to all those hundreds of years ago. He said, this is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Passover, it's not just another date in the calendar. It restarts the calendar. The Exodus was such a a momentous event for us that From then on, God effectively says, this is the month I defeated your enemy. 
This is the month I gave you your freedom. This is the month you became an independent people. Time itself is going to be reframed around this new reality of redemption that I've worked for you. So you see, Passover, it's a New Year's party too. But I wonder if you can see what what Jesus was doing that night in the upper room. He was declaring a new, new beginning. He had it all planned out. He knew there was a, a price on his head. Earlier on in the week, he'd overturned the tables in the temple and stopped the sacrifices being made there for a whole chunk of the day. It's probably fair to say that the leaders were a bit ticked off. They wanted to get rid of him, and he knew it. But he also knew that he had to have this one last Passover with us. Jesus had uh, told us several times before that he was going to have to die. Then none of us believed it. In fact, he told me off once for telling him that I thought he was speaking a load of rubbish. But the closest he'd come to saying why was so that he might be a ransom for many. And again, we just looked at each other. What on earth is he talking about? What on earth does he mean? But looking back now, it's easy to understand why he never told us straight up. Because he wanted that meal to be our explanation. And knowing that he was a wanted man, Jesus had secretly prearranged it all to make sure that nothing would get in the way of this final, all-important lesson for us. Even I and James and John, his inner circle, even we didn't know the plans he'd made. He simply told us to go into the city to find some certain man, to give him a code word. The teacher says, my appointed time is near, and assured us that he'd fix everything. Jesus knew that what... What he wanted to share with us was so important that it couldn't be left to chance. He knew he was going to be arrested. He knew he was going to be killed. But he also knew that he needed one more night to tell us what it was all about. And isn't that just like Jesus? That he didn't do it by sitting us down and giving us a lecture but by sitting us down around a table and sharing a meal with us. So there we all were at the table. Jesus and the 12 of us who had left our our nets or our tax booths and, and followed him around everywhere for three years, watching his every move, listening to every word he spoke. But from the outset, the evening had a strange eerie feel to it. Someone here is going to hand me over to those who want to kill me, he said. We were all shocked. One by one, I said, not not me. Don't mean me, do you? Jesus wouldn't name names. He simply said it was one of us, someone who who ate with him every day. And from then on, this special meal, well, it almost had a feel of a murder mystery to it. There was a traitor in our midst. Jesus, he was dead certain of it. But who? Can you imagine the, the glances that we shared around that table, eyeing each other up suspiciously, made me ask if I was being true to Jesus myself. We, we each searched our own hearts, and, and as we did so, Jesus picked up the special bread, the unleavened bread that we eat at Passover, and he gave thanks to God, as he always did. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. So far, so normal. 
But then as he broke it and gave it to us, he didn't say this is the bread of affliction which our fathers ate in the land of Egypt. That's what you're meant to say. No, he he didn't say anything about this being the bread that our our ancestors ate when they left Egypt because they didn't have time to wait for the bread to rise. He didn't say any of that. Instead, he said something very strange. He said, take and eat. This is my body. Nobody's ever said anything like that at a Passover meal before. And we 12 looked at each other confused, as if we weren't confused already. What on earth does he mean? For centuries, our people have broken bread to eat with the Passover lamb, sacrificed for us, whose blood we painted on the door frames of our house, told the angel of death to pass over. But, but, but here it was Jesus seeming to rip up that textbook and giving it a whole new meaning. It was as if he was saying, what's about to happen to me will become food for you. As if he was saying, my death is life. For me. Just like the Passover lamb, he was telling us that he would die in my place. His death would set me free. And not just me, but, but everyone else who, who is there at this table. Everyone who, who licks to him to, to give him life. Obviously, it's easy looking back in hindsight, but we didn't, have, we didn't realize at the time that Jesus breaking bread was going to be such a graphic illustration of what was going to happen the next day. But that wasn't all, because things got stranger still after supper when when Jesus took the cup of wine. Now, again, for for those of you who haven't shared many Passover meals like I have, I should say that drinking wine at Passover isn't a strange thing. We, we, We like our wine. And the Passover meal revolves around four cups of wine, each one standing for one of the promises God made to our ancestors in Exodus chapter 6. You know them, I'm sure. I am the Lord your God, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. One. Two, I will free you from being slaves to them. And three, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. And four, I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. But as he did with the bread, so Jesus did something totally different with the cup of wine. Jesus gave thanks as usual. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who created the fruit of the vine. And then holding up the cup, he said to us, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. We couldn't believe what our ears were hearing. Drink his blood? No way. We Jews, we never eat blood in anything. The Torah says, the life of a creature is in the blood and I've given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Every good Jew knows that. And again, like so much of that night, it was only afterwards that dawned on me. That was the point. Jesus was pouring out his blood, his life for us to cover our sins, to make us right with God again. And in that moment, the, the, the peculiar words that, that John the Baptist spoke all those years ago 
flashed through my mind. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Just as the blood of the, the Passover Lamb protected all who shouted in the house when the angel of the Lord passed through the streets of Egypt over a thousand years before that night, so now Jesus seemed to be saying that all who take shelter with him in his death would be safe from the eternal consequences of God's justice. Only the blood that was going to avert God's righteous anger wasn't the blood of a lamb, but of a man. Our rabbi, our teacher, our friend, Jesus. It was as if he was saying, today we're saved not by, by smearing blood on the outside of our homes, but by letting it wash us clean from within. But there was something else that Jesus said that night that stopped me in my tracks. He said that the cup he was sharing with us was his blood of the covenant. Well, the, the prophets that would spoken hundreds of years before of God renewing the covenant that we kept breaking through our idolatry, through our persistent unfaithfulness. God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah. He said, this is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Do you see, the thing God had promised hundreds of years before was coming true around that table. Jesus was telling us that his death was the way God was going to forgive his people and put his laws within us, writing them on our hearts. God was remaking his family around that table table. He was getting rid of all of our guilt because Jesus' blood was being poured out for the forgiveness of sins. But those simple words, eat, drink, were also the way Jesus wanted to get inside of us. Take, he, take me into yourself, he was saying. Because when I'm in you, that's when my laws will be written on your heart. Jesus and his death wasn't just being the, the faithful covenant partner that our people were supposed to be. He was giving himself to us so that his perfect life might take root in my imperfect life. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. That was the fourth Passover promise God made, and that was the promise Jesus was renewing with us around that table in the upper room. And that's why we keep celebrating this meal together. That's why I keep telling all the churches to keep celebrating this meal together as often as they can. Because not only does this meal remind us that we are God's people and not only does it confirm God's promise to save all who come to him through Jesus. But it's a chance for us to renew our covenant with him. A chance for us to pledge ourselves afresh as his faithful servants. Our empty hands held out in front of us say to God, we're yours. We feast on all that Jesus is for us and we give ourselves to him, to his service, to be made one with him and to become ever more like him for the sake of the whole world. We sung a final song of praise to God and then we went out into the dark, still night. 
Jesus turned to us and said, you're all going to fall away. Every one of you, because of what's going to happen to me. And then he quoted from the prophet Zechariah, I'll strike the shepherd and the sheep will, of the flock will be scattered. Then he talked about meeting us in Galilee once he'd risen. And again, we didn't have a clue what he meant. <laughs> what do you mean, once you've risen? And I, well, I blurted out with my typical zeal, I'll never fall away from you, Jesus. I'll go with you anywhere. If, if you're going to be killed on a cross, I'm going to be on the next one. But Jesus looked to me, tears in his eyes, with a look I'll never forget. This very night, you'll disown me three times, Peter. A few hours' time, you're going to say you don't know me. He was right, of course. Not just about me denying him, though. That's true enough. But it was also right that in his death is forgiveness and freedom and healing and new life. And God knows I needed it just as much as anyone. The psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Friends, have you tasted? Have you seen? Have you taken refuge in him?